feel selfish for wanting to take a trip without them and some comments my husband has made he's like I don't really understand why you would want to spend money on a trip for yourself when we should be spending the money on a trip for all of us as a family absolutely not in no way are you selfish Yo, yo, what's up? This is John with the Dr. John Deloney Show, the greatest mental health and marriage and parenting and whatever else is going on in your life podcast ever. Man, I'm so glad that you're with us. I've uh, been out of town for a few days, and it is awesome to be back with the gang. Um, and by the gang, I mean everybody in the booth and, most importantly, you guys. Uh, if you want to be on the show, give me a buzz, 1-844-693-3291. That's one 693 Three two nine one, and if you're going to be in Nashville, in the Nashville Franklin area, love for you to come visit and watch the show live. We got some chairs out here, and free coffee and snacks that'll give you some of the diabetes, and you can come hang out, and it would be awesome to see you. All right, so uh, before we go to my new friend Sammy, so I recently had a show, and on the show I was talking to somebody um, about with with a newborn with a kid. And no, no, I was someone who was about to have a kid or was considering having a kid. Was that what it was? Yeah, it was the guy that um, was nervous about having a kid. There you go. Okay, okay. And I made the statement, um, you will never truly know the depths of your ability to love until you hold your first child. And um, usually... Instagram, like social media is one of two things. It's like, yeah, bro, you go girl. Or it's, you're the worst person ever. And I would like to set you on fire. Um, and then occasionally I get really thoughtful. Um, what I would say, thoughtful, good engagement, like pushback. Like I disagree with that. Occasionally my friends like Dr. Norton will call me and be like, Hey, you botched that one big time. Here's the reality. Um, but I sometimes will get some thoughtful pushback. And this particular time, um, was someone I've never met, never talked to, and I'm about to hear, but it was Sammy from uh, Indiana. And she reached out and was super kind. And um, so, uh, Sammy, I'm going to bring you in here. Sammy, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Dude, number one, thank you so much for even agreeing to be on the show and, and to talk this through. Um, I want to tell you out of the gate, I'm so grateful that you had the courage to write in and say, I think I disagree with what you're saying. And I, I like that meant the world to me, how you did it, why you did it. And you gave some great rationales. Like you, I could tell that you were uh, not just throwing grenades. And so on behalf of humanity, who's all stuck in this Instagram <laughs> world, thank you for being a good, for being a good human. How are you? Yeah, no problem. I'm good. How are you doing? Good, good, good. Um, Okay, so I reached out back to you and said, hey, would you, I would love to talk about this on the show because I, I know this particular conversation is being had all over the place. And it's a, mm -hmm. it's a part of a broader conversation I've been struggling with um, as I'm trying to write, write a new book and try to dig into some of the scholarship around this stuff. So for everybody listening, walk us back through, I make the statement on the show you'll never truly know the depth of your ability to love, the depths of love until you hold your first kid. And you heard that and you're in our gang and tell me how that hit you, what you felt, what you it, thought, walk me through that. And yeah, so don't, I've been, don't spare my feelings, by the way, let, let it rip. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I've been listening to every episode you've come out with and it's just been a great place for me to connect on different um, topics in my life that I've been going through. And so I really respect you and what all you have to say. And I really take everything that you say to heart. So when you said that, it, it kind of broke my heart a little bit. Um, just because I hear a lot of that talk in the world saying like, you'll never know love until you have a kid. And I think it just puts a lot of other people who don't have kids into this weird situation where we're less than. Uh, so tell me, so my wife and I struggled with infertility for years years and mm -hmm. years. Um, and so I, I get that impulse. Tell me where, um, tell me why it makes you feel less than. Um, <clears throat> cause it feels like people think you're only important if you have kids and you won't contribute anything else into the world unless you have kids. Where does that and story come from? Um, 
I think I mostly hear it from parents. Okay. Um, yeah. So a little backstory, me and my husband have been married for almost seven years okay. and we always like nonchalantly would say that we would have kids. Um, but that always just got pushed back and back and back. And then my sister, I have an identical twin sister. Um, she had her first kid in 2020. And so that's when everyone said it started bombarding me with, oh, when are you guys going to have kids? And that's kind of when we started, you know, really thinking like, is this something we actually want to do? Because it's a huge major decision that I think a lot of people just don't take the time to think about a lot. Mm. So that's just what we've been thinking about for the past couple of years and trying to make that decision. So how has that is, as y'all land on the decision of, are we going to do this? Are we going to not? How is that? How are you feeling pulled in a less than position? Um, just the way that like some parents and some other people talk to people who don't have kids. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, well, you think you're tired? Well, try being up uh, with a newborn and like always trying to one up people who don't have kids or think that, oh, you're not going through any anything hard in your life. Uh, or you don't. Yeah, I'll give you something to cry about. Right. Yeah. 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 OK. OK. So a couple of thoughts here. I, I, I absolutely remember that. And I remember, I remember walking past a room in our house and we had made the decision to have kids and we couldn't. Right. So, um, but we also didn't want to announce that to the world. I remember having a mm-hmm. hard, hard conversation with a family member and who said, Hey, we've made some decisions because y'all clearly don't want kids. And it was like a knife to the soul, dude. You know what I mean? Cause I was like, well, hold on. Like, just cause you know what I mean? You made all these suppositions about me and my fa- my wife and our, our family. And, um, so yeah, that's brutal. Um, and mm-hmm. I, I want you to hear me say like loud and clear there, there is no less than right. Mm-hmm. It's just simply different. And, but I will say this. My wife uh, and I were talking and she said something once when she was first pregnant with Hank and it stuck with me. And then I circled back to it when she was, uh, went another several years and had a couple of wild surgeries and wildness. Um, One life-saving surgery and then we ended up with Josephine. She said, I feel sorry for you. This is her talking to me. I said, why? And she said, you will never know how close I am to our son. I was like, yes, you, I'm his dad. And she goes, no, dude, he's been in my body for nine months. You'll never know. You'll never know what, how close I am breastfeeding the kid in the middle of the night, just us two, you're snoozing like an old man. Like, and I had to, there was a moment of, yeah, you're exactly right. I'm never going to know that. And it doesn't mean that I was less than or that I was dysfunctional or broken, but it was all, it was just, a, it was just, it just was a was, right? And so mm-hmm. what I'm wrestling with, and you can, you can, I'm hoping you can teach me. I'm wrestling with how do I absorb truth? In my life, dude, I had a dog. Her name was Molly. She was a basset hound. She was my hound dog. She slept on my pillow with me. Um, the joke in my house was she was in my bed long before my wife was. Like, she, like that dog was my ride or die. I brought her to meetings. I brought that dog everywhere. And, um, like I loved that dog. I loved that dog. I loved my friends dearly. And then I held my first kid. And so I don't feel like I'm in a place where I can honestly say I understood what that meant until, and at the same time, how do I communicate that without inferring that it's somehow better than it's just an Mm -hmm. is right? Like some pools are three feet deep. Some pools are 20 feet deep. Um, depending on what you want to do with your life, pools are going to be different, but I can't deny that that pool's 20 feet deep. So how, how, how do I, is it something that you have to own that I'm not going to let people make me feel less than, is it something that I need to own when I'm communicating Is it something we need to do it together? How do we, how do we have that conversation? I think it's, it's both parties. Um, the one side who is the child free couple, you know, like being firm in their stance and saying like, this is what we want. Mm-hmm. Um, like we won't feel bad for it. But then I think on the other side, it's for people to accept that and to not, you know, feel bad for them or think they're less than or 
um, like when you said you won't know, you won't truly know love until you hold your kid. There are other ways to love people. Um, Absolutely. Like that's not the only form of love. Like I understand it's a different love. So I think just for people who have kids, not totally summarizing something and equating that to kids. Ah, so maybe a better way to say it was you won't ever know the depth of your capacity to love until you hold your first kid. But that doesn't mean you're not going to love deeply and wildly and recklessly. And like, so there's different. Yeah. So I, I, I can see where I said that incorrectly. Cause I made a blanket statement about love. You'll never know love until you've done this. That's not true. Yeah. Right. Huh? Okay. That makes sense. So on behalf of myself, uh, I apologize for saying it that way. Cause I made a blanket statement about the nature of love that just simply was inaccurate. Um, mm-hmm. And I think I should have said it differently and said, uh, and you guys listening, I'm, I'm processing this in real time. I should have said, there's a depth and a capacity to love that you won't understand until you ho- you're responsible for um, or until you hold somebody. But that doesn't mean you're not ever going to love, right? You're, you're going to have your spouse. You're going to have your friends. You're going to have your pets. You're going to have whatever. You're going to love all sorts of people. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Hmm, I love that. Okay, so how do you, on your side... Um, how do you create a world where other people don't get a vote or very select few people get a vote? Um, I have just learned to have really tough skin over the past couple of years. And hmm. is like that a sustainable, really, is that a sustainable way to live? It seems like an exhausting way to live. N- no, I think it, it was more exhausting letting other people have the freedom to my emotions. And so over the years I've, like the past couple of years, because I've gone through a lot of hard things in my life. Um, I've learned to, um, what emotions do I allow to each person? Uh, and so, and that okay. the whole kid subject is one of them because I know that some people will say dumb stuff because they just don't know, Yeah, you know, they don't know the situation I'm in. So I let that slide. But then, you know, when someone does know my stance and you keep, you know, saying the same stuff, then I think that's where the the education comes in. Hmm. Could I recommend instead of looking to form calluses, looking to, because here's what I think when I think um, I'm forming calluses, the image in my head is of a tightening fist. I'm becoming hard and strong to this instead of opening my hands even wider. And letting that kind of stuff pass through me like air, like a spirit, right? Um, I, I'm going to make my way through life not trying to be calloused as much as I'm going to let that pass through me like wind. Like that's not even a thing. You can say whatever you want and that's not going to affect my mood or my body's not going to feel like it has to respond in some sort of stri- Does that make sense? One of those feels yeah, like I- a lot of work and the other feels like a infinitely less anxious way to live. Yeah, I don't think I'm necessarily like callousing myself off to people but I have like grew up as a kid who it was very emotional and was you know let my parents really control those Uh, emotions and so as an adult I've had to learn what do I allow people into well good for you and how do I respond to things awesome 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 um did you have you ever did you read that uh own your past change your future that book I wrote um, I started to, and then my husband took it and he started reading it and Otherwise. gave me some cliff notes. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. So I want you to hang on the line. I want you to read it. There's a, there's a story in that book, um, about my friend Lisa, who was in my, one of my counseling cohorts. And, um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll end this call this way. Um, we were sitting in a circle and I've told this story on the show before we were sitting in a circle as, as counseling classes do. And we were talking about, you know, different scenarios, different case studies. And um, one of my great mentors and friends and professor, Dr. Uh, Brett Hendricks, he laid out um, a case study. And the case study was, what happens if you've been working with a client for like six months and the client walks in and looks at you and says, hey, you suck at this. You've taken my money for six months. I've paid you thousands of dollars. I did your little exercise with my, with my romantic partner and she left me. I did your little how to ask for a raise exercise and my boss and not only didn't give me the raise, but gave me like a, like a reprimand. You're not good at what you, and I was new to it, right? I was just seeing clients in my practicum. And I remember saying out loud, that would kill me. That would decimate me. 
And um, Lisa, who's one of the most wise, she's just awesome. Um, she's brilliant. She's been a therapist for years and years and years. She looked at me and said, John, they don't get that. And I rolled my eyes and I was like, oh gosh, is that one of the like, dumb counselors speak? And she said, magic words, you get to choose who hurts your feelings. And I was like, no, that's not right. And she goes, yeah, other people can take away your livelihood. And or actually on the way home, I was thinking about this. Other people can take away your livelihood. They can take away, they can, they can um, wreck your car. They can take your job away. They can take your life away. But I get to choose who I give access to my heart in order to hurt me. And I asked her, I was like, oh, so how many people do you give access to your heart? You know, I was, trying, I was just rolling my eyes. And she said like five, four or five or six, something like that, a very small number. And so on my, on my bike ride home, uh, I would, I'll never forget this. It was a hot West Texas afternoon. The wind was blowing. It was just hot and I was riding my bike and I was frustrated and I was trying to think who would I allow in this little magical box? And I realized I was allowing everybody. I was allowing all my students, all my students' parents, all these administrators, all these people at other universities I didn't know who are colleagues, um, I was letting internet people, I was letting all kinds. So I just started whittling it down. I took my parents out and who I love, I love my parents, but I took them out of the box. I took my in-laws out. I took all these different people and I got down to four or five or six people. And I rem remember, um, calling a couple of them and said, Hey, I just want you to know I've given you access to my innermost being. Use it wisely, please. Because if you tell me like, hey, you're being an idiot or you're being foolish or you've made a terrible mistake, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to respond in kind because I trust you. And I'll tell you this. It was the single most freeing exercise I've done in years. Um, I felt like, uh, like I was free. If my wife tells me something, if my buddy Todd tells me, like very select group of people, if they tell me something, I'm in, right? Other than that, people just don't get a vote. And I'll tell you, it's like, uh, like I was describing, it's like opening your hand up to the world and letting it just be. So um, I want to thank you for being so thoughtful and kind in your response and for calling me out and saying, hey, I experienced love all over the place and I don't have kids. And so what you said isn't accurate and hold true. And the way I said that, I still hold to my, my belief that the capacity for love deepens when you hold your kid, but it's just simply dishonest to say you don't will never know love, right? That's just not true. And so I want to thank you for calling me out in such a uh, dignified and respectable way. And I really appreciate you, Sammy. Yeah, thanks for um, being able to listen to all of that too. I know some people don't, but thanks for being open to it. Of course, man. And um, hang on the line here and we're going to get you a copy of the book. And um, that way your husband won't steal your crap anymore. He can get his, he can get his own. How kind will that be? Awesome. Sammy, you're the best. Uh, hey, everybody, hang on. We'll be right back. Hey, Deloney here, and I've got a word from this episode's sponsor, BetterHelp. Hey, look, there's a lot of things we don't get to choose on this wild ride called life, right? The neighbor's kid learning to play trombone, weird things trending on the TikToks or whatever that is. We don't get to choose the weather. But when you realize how much you do have a choice in, it's so empowering. Check this out. You get to decide who you want to be. I get to ask myself the question, who do I want to be? You get to choose who speaks into your life and you get to choose to pursue meaningful relationships. This is life changing stuff, but I'll be honest, it's not easy. These are new skills that we all have to learn and therapy is a great place to practice these new skills. And that's why I love BetterHelp. BetterHelp is affordable online therapy that can match you with a therapist quickly and it lets you switch any time to make sure it's the right fit. And just like in-person therapy, it can help equip you with the tools you need to work towards being who you want to be. Because you don't just have to let life happen to you, you can take it head on. So visit BetterHelp.com slash Deloney today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Deloney. All right, we are back. Um, get ready, everybody. This is everybody's favorite segment. Facts are your friends. Here come the tunes. This is so, so great. Get your bandanas and climb into the Camaros with this rock tunes. This is like straight Marble Reds. Nothing else. Just OG in a camo hat. Joe's rocking a camo hat. It's, a per it's perfect. All right. Facts are your friends. 2023 dating trends revealed. Now, it's important for me to note. I haven't dated in a long, long time. Um, several years ago, I was back in Texas and 
a buddy of mine had, was divorced and was dating again. And so we were out to lunch having a burger. And I was like, all right, dude, I kind of live in vicariously. Like, what's it like, man? You're like back out there. What's it like? <laughs> I'll never forget, man. Uh, he leaned across the table and his eyes got kind of narrow, like lasered in. And he said, I don't care what's happening in your marriage. Figure it out. It's terrible out here. And I started dying laughing. I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, remember back in college when you would see somebody like, you know, out somewhere at some event or you're like all hanging out, whatever. And you saw somebody, you thought they're cute and you went up to him. You're like, Hey, I'm John. And, uh, like, like, what's your name? And we can I buy you a drink or you want to come sit with our, our buddies. You and your friends want to come over. He's like, if you do that now, it's stalking. They will call somebody on you or they will like, l like cut eyes at security and they'll ask you to leave. You can't do that anymore. You got to go get somebody's uh, social information and then stalk them for days or weeks online. And you just bypass the first one through nine dates by, I, I don't need to ask you what your favorite music is. I just look through your, your Instagram reel and look at all the concerts you've been to and all the shirts you wear. Like all, I get all your fashion. I get all the things you're into, all your friends. And then after that, you go on your first date and then you just make out. And so he was like, dude, the whole thing, the whole thing's crazy. It's all different now. And so I decided I was going to work on my marriage. And so here we are, 2023, years later, dating trends revealed. This is from dating.com. That sounds like a reliable source. It says this, data says resolution dating, inflation, and metaverse dating. Oh, God almighty. We'll define online dating in 2023. The article says, um, there's, not, there's not an author here. It just says uh, Yahoo Finance. Singles are looking for partners who help them stay true to their own New Year's resolutions. Singles are continuing to rely on technology to make new connections and to build relationships. So I can see that. Like if you are somebody, you know, we talk about... Um, I'm going to create some new identities and then I'm going to backfill my new identity with actions that lead me towards, right? So I'm a fit person. I'm a person who takes care of my body. I'm going to date somebody that maybe wants to go work out with me or go hiking with me or go for walks. Um, or somebody that if I say, hey, I'm just going to, I'm going to get a burger without the bun. They're not like, oh my gosh, are you kidding? <laughs> I'm going to date somebody that's going to lead me towards my goals. That makes sense to me. Um, and singles are continuing to rely on, rely on technology to, Make new connections and to build relationships. I call bullcrap on a stick in a box on the back of a pony riding through the desert on that one. I think that's not true. We'll get to that later. Um, it goes on to say, in doing so, the goal is to find a partner that aligns with and supports your own personal goals, whether they're related to your career, fitness, hobby, or new skills that you want to learn. Here's what I'm, I, I, makes me uncomfortable about this. Anytime you are making changes, you're working towards goals. Let's say you want to run a marathon. Training for a marathon is awful. It's just long runs, right? Sometimes it's cold. Sometimes it's hot. Sometimes the runs are awesome and they feel great. But it's training's hard, right? Um, getting out of debt is hard. I have to say no to everything and put all this money I'm making and I'm working side hustles and extra jobs. All that money is going to pay a credit card off for something I bought a year ago or five years ago or a college class I took 10 years ago, right? So accomplishing a goal is hard. And when you meet somebody and you and, and their current version of themselves aligns and supports your own personal goals, it becomes utilitarian. I'm going to align with you because you are going to help me get to where I want to go. And as I'm going there, it's going to be uncomfortable. And I, my fear here is that I'm going to project my discomfort onto you. And so I know it's a balance, right? You don't want to meet somebody, you don't want to date somebody whose um, vision for their life doesn't align with you at all. But this is a lot of pressure to put on the new person that you're just meeting. And the chances of you getting frustrated along the way as you become somebody who, I'm a vice president kind of guy. So I'm going to start doing vice president kind of things. That's awkward and hard as you make that transition. And it's real easy if you are leaning on somebody that they get the brunt of the discomfort. They become a source of blame or frustration. 55% um, of respondents rated common goals and values as more important than physical appearance and attraction. Looks like we're growing up. Okay, then we went to uh, resolution dating. 
60% no, um, noted that they would pump the brakes on a relationship if the partner's behaviors or habits were hindering them from reaching fitness and wellness goals. I don't understand that. Mainly, be I guess I do. I guess I do. I guess if every time I worked out, my wife was like, you're the worst. I hate you. I, that would probably wouldn't bode well. Or if I wanted to eat healthy and she was like, more marshmallows? That probably wouldn't go well either. Um, here's my concern. So when I started uh, grad school, my wife and I were both in graduate school at the same time. And let me back up. When I was a kid, my mom went back to college late in life. And she is a mythologist. So she was studying mythology and she was she learned old English and she was reading some of these original Shakespearean texts and their old original language, all this stuff. So my mom was all into this and I was like 16, 17. And I'd be watching like the Astros and my mom would get in front of the TV and mute it and be like, you guys got to listen to this. And she would read us something in old Shakespearean, old English or middle English. I don't know what Shakespeare is written in. And she was dying laughing. Like it was some great inside joke in King Lear that I didn't get as a 16 year old. And I remember being like, oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. And I also very clearly remember my mom was in heaven. She loved it. So fast forward, my wife and I are in grad school. I remember like one day we were out to dinner and I was like, hey, listen, I'm studying student development theory and how colleges operate. You are studying reading literacy and how children's brains learn to read. I will never, ever care about that. And you are never going to care about what I'm studying. Could we just make a deal now that we will never talk about what the other person's studying? Could that, that, would that be amazing? And I thought she was going to weep with joy. She was so excited. She's like, oh God, yes, I hate talking to you about whatever this nonsense you want to talk about. And so we made an agreement there. Like, let's just not ever talk about it. And then over the years, like we shared a laptop for a long time before everybody had their own laptop and I would open up the laptop and she'd be working on an academic paper. She was sending for publication and I would read a, f a page or two. And I remember being like, who are you? How do you know all this stuff? She's amazing. And over the years I've realized, I think that was a mistake. I think I screwed that up. Then fast forward to now I'm in a totally new industry. I'm learning about mental health issues. I'm talking to hundreds, if not thousands of people every week. And um, or for show listeners, dozens, right? There's only like 18 of you out there. Um, and so I just had a conversation with her, uh, about a few weeks ago said, Hey, we made this deal a long time ago. I want to be able to talk to you about my work and I want to hear about what you're working on and the things you're experiencing. And so we are having to learn how to meet different needs as we've moved our relationship on. So why am I telling you all that? It's if you're dating somebody, if you say like this person is going to help me meet my goals and needs, what happens over time if those goals and needs change? And so I want you to obviously focus on somebody who's going to help you with your, with your goals and needs and not lean on them too much like we talked about earlier. But also be willing to be with somebody. Look for somebody who is, holds the world very loosely, has some very strong core values convictions, but holds beliefs and other things very loosely. Man, I was a vegan at one time, and then I was full keto at one time. And now I've got more, I, I, I've developed a, a, a different protocol that works better for me. And I don't come after me vegan and, and keto people. But I'm a person that likes to say I was wrong. And I like to find out when I was wrong. I like to change my mind. And my wife is too. And so more important than, being with somebody who helped me meet my immediate goals, I'm with somebody who supports me wherever I head off into the woods and who's walking alongside me. And I do the same. And our religious beliefs have diverged over time. Our political beliefs have diverged over time. We've changed. We've become different people in multiple different arenas. And so if you're looking for someone like I'm a fitness person and I only will date a fitness person, that's cool. But there may come a day when Going to CrossFit seven times a week turns into I've got two little kids and a full-time job and I've got a small little home gym where I crank out 40 minutes four or five times a week. That's what I can get done. And if those people, I, I only, we're CrossFit people, then you're going to have some real problems. And so I want people to, resolution dating, cool. Um, it seems very short-sighted. Um, tight budget means monogamy. I love this. 
61% of singles are opting to date one person at a time versus meeting multiple potential partners simply to save money on first dates. Way to go, America. Um, transitional dating, 33% of singles plan to date in the... Okay, listen, listen. This is the one that gives me hemorrhoids. 33% of singles plan to date in the metaverse. In the metaverse. That's not real. That's not a thing. Here's the thing about the metaverse. It's not real. Uh, using avatars to put a bigger emphasis on communication and, <laughs> I love this, digital intimacy before in-person discovery. Few things in the world give me the heebie-jeebies more than the phrase digital intimacy. I can't recommend against this enough. So I want you to go on a, a thought experiment with me. Up until all of human history, up until the invention of the radio. And then fast forward to podcast. I talk to callers, live callers on this show. And we have back and forth. We talk about intimate things and deep things. And we're having a human interaction. Up until all human history, until just recently, like a snapshot, 100 years, 200 years, you had to be in the room with a group of people to have this level of insight into these intimate conversations. Someone could relay them to you, but you couldn't hear them live. And now we have podcasts and earbuds and you can be vacuuming, having a ringside seat to a conversation that in all of human history, you would not have been able to have access to up until just now. Similarly, like think of photographs. Our brains are not wired to see pictures of ourselves when we were five. That is brand stinking new. And so we have the illusion of intimacy. And I know this because I talk to people out in, the, in airports and at live events and people will come up and tell me things about their husbands or their spouses or their sex life. And I often will go, whoa, I don't know you. Like you're telling me a lot and we're in a public place. I was peeing at an airport, in an airport bathroom. And a dude came to the stall next to me. I'm peeing. I'm just looking at the tile ahead of me like you're supposed to. No eye contact. Don't be weird. Just looking at the tile. And the guy, I guess, looked over and was like, hey, are you Delo John Deloney? And I was like, yeah, man. I'm peeing. And he goes, dude, I love your show. Still peeing. And then he goes, hey, man. So my wife, and I just stopped. I stopped him and I was like hey man it's not a good time and he goes oh yeah 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 yeah." and here's the thing his body knows was, was like has his body understands that we are friends that we have a connection because he listens to the show he knows about my kids he knows what makes me laugh he knows our my jokes he knows how stupid I could be and how like not good at radio I am and how not good at podcasting I am he knows all those things because he's internalized them and his body has this false sense of it connection it's not real it's not real it is real but it's not real so I tell you this to tell you, don't date in the metaverse because you can transmit information digitally I can transmit the words I love you. I can transmit pictures of my naked body. I can transmit pictures of my home and my childhood. I can send you info. But our bodies are co-regulated. I only know where I am in space because there's another living being in my presence. And so this, it creates this mass illusion that's not real. And different parts of your body think it's connected and other parts don't. And we are Dude, we are dancing on the nuclear buttons when it comes to our physiology combined with technology, combined with our neurology and psychology. It's madness. So I cannot tell you, I can't tell you enough. Don't date in the metaverse. But if you play Legends of Zelda, dude, the game's rad. It's cool. Play Zelda. Get out of the metaverse and find ways, even if you got to use an app, to swipe right, swipe left, whatever. Connect with real people in the real world you owe it to your body i'll say it this way there's no such thing as digital intimacy it's not real 
It's not real. Have human intimacy. So that's the uh, 2023 dating trends. Oh, gosh. Kelly, this just makes me sad. Good luck, everybody. <laughs> we'll be right back. All right, so we're back. Um, hey, John. Yes. So you were talking about somebody coming up while you were peeing. Yes. I've got a little similar story. <laughs> so quite a few years ago when I worked on Dave's show, um, my former ob Jen, and I say former. <laughs> so I'm in the office, so in the good. stirrups, exam is happening. And he realizes where I work, so he starts asking me 401k questions. <laughs> oh my God. So I had to say that, um, hey, can we have this conversation when I can see your eyes? Yeah. <laughs> Not now. So some people but, aren't that aware. Oh, my gosh. No metaverse dating. No metaverse dating. And no talking about sensitive topics in sensitive moments. Is that the way to say that? That's fair. I'm trying to be sensitive because some people let their kids watch this show. Listen, you should, don't let your kids listen to the show. All right, let's go to Leanna. Leanna in Virginia. What's up, Leanna? Hi, how's it going? So good. How about you? I'm doing well. I'm trying to keep my kids from listening to the show a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> good for you. You're a good parent. You're a good parent. They, they, they enjoy the peeing stories, though, so oh, that's good. always fun. Oh, good. <laughs> That's uh, my wife tells me my humor capped out at about 11. So perfect. <laughs> uh, you're not dating in the metaverse, are you? No, no. Happily married. So. Good. Good. In the real no. world, you're married to like a human? Yes. Yes. Married to a human, oh, a, a mechanic. So he's very real world. Oh, very real world. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So what's <laughs> up, Leanna? How can I help? So I am, my question was, um, am I selfish for wanting to take a trip by myself without my wonderful husband and my, um, kids, um, a little backstory. So I have two kids. I have a four-year-old and an almost two-year-old. So I'm kind of in the middle of it all. Um, I am a part-time realtor and a part-time MLM consultant, um, and I'm in school full-time taking 17 credits right now um, online. So there's not really a whole lot of downtime for me. I feel like really the only time I can get away is during the very short deer hunting season that we have here in Minnesota. Um, Your deer hunting then, season is absurd, by the way. <laughs> it is, it is. <laughs> but um, I try and milk it for all it's worth because... As soon as I come out of the deer stand, I'm back to being mom. Yes. So, you know, I feel selfish for wanting to take a trip without them. And some comments my husband has made mm. sometimes makes me feel even more so. Tell <laughs> me what those comments are. Um, well, it's mainly like he does this dirt bike trip where he goes across the state um, with a couple of his buddies. And he's like, oh, it costs like hardly nothing, just the gas for the dirt bike and, and maybe some food. So he's like, I don't really understand why you would want to spend money on a trip for yourself when we should be spending the money on a trip for all of us as a family. And so then I'm like, okay. Why is it, why right. is it either or? That's what I don't understand either. Um, you know, before his his knowledge or thoughts where he couldn't keep me safe. And I grew up in a military family. I can keep myself plenty safe. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, yes, the deer need to be worried about you. So let me I'll just answer this directly. Absolutely not. In no way are you selfish. I just, listen, I just finished, um, I just finished three months of what I would call hell of, of write, book writing. Hard. It's just like getting up at 5 a.m., going to work, and then heading off into a dark hole by yourself and getting done at 10 or 11 at night. I mean, it's been month after month on the road, writing in hotel rooms. It's been chaos. Mm -hmm. I just hit send on the manuscript last week. And that weekend, I got in a, I mean, on Wednesday, I got on a plane and flew to Utah to meet up two great guys, um, Dustin and Steve. And I went with a buddy here that I work with at Ramsey. And we went on a hunting trip in the middle of nowhere, Utah. and. On the surface, it could be, I felt, I felt what you're feeling. It felt a little bit selfish. It was the most important thing I could do because I had to go clear the cobwebs. 
so that I can mm. come back and be present. Otherwise, my kids and my wife become another task, right? They become just another thing in order. Like, I got to do my classwork. I got to do this. I got to go hug my kid. I got to go show up to the school thing. I got to make sure my wife's happy. And they deserve more than to be part of my checklist, yeah. right? And so yeah. it's critical that we get away and separate. And I mm-hmm. absolutely love, love, love when my wife goes to hang out with her friends. She comes back renewed and refreshed, and she's got new thoughts and new ideas. I love it, love it, love it. Um, and it sucks because, yeah, right? I got to do bedtimes and morning times and breakfast to make sure people are putting on deodorant and making lunches. I got to do all that. I don't like doing that. And um, But it's part of being in a partnership, right? It's part of being married. Um, I I think going down the road of, but my trip costs this, and why does your trip cost? That's dangerous ground. That's comparison, yeah. man, and that's just that's just gonna melt uh, uh, melts a marriage every time. Marriage can't be fifty fifty like that. Well, you spent this much, so I get to spend this much. That's like, it can't be like that. Otherwise, it just right. becomes this tip for tap nest forever. And man, you can't build a relationship on that. Right. Well, and I feel like that's what he saw growing up because uh-huh. his mom would take trips and now she does trips with her Mm daughter-in-laws and then my father-in-law would go on a canoe trip in the boundary waters with the boys and it'd be very you know less costly than what hers were but they'd be arguing about it and that's just what he saw yeah I, i think it's i think it's important to call that out this is what we both this is what you saw growing up this isn't how we're gonna do this yeah because the thing that brings you joy is I don't know what trip you want to go on a cruise like getting away getting out on the open water that's a thing and the thing that brings mm-hmm. you joy is riding motorbikes across the country I mean across the state yeah. by the way motorbikes are expensive and so maybe the <laughs> trip itself isn't expensive but all in like I can do that I can have this really fancy sit could gear that I got good grief it's like an Armani suit and I can have really fancy like hunting equipment and then i could be like hey my trip don't cost nothing i'm just going out to sit in the woods for a few few hours that's ridiculous right right so right. my cost is just all on the front end and my wife may right. spend nothing ever 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 and then want to go on a cruise or go hang out with her friends but that's, dude i think that's amazing it goes back right. to putting your oxygen mask on first here's the only time i'll call you out okay is okay. if you are going on this trip to run away hmm. okay um, if you okay. use, if you are out of capacity and you feel like you have to escape them, one is running okay. from a thing, one is running towards a thing, and it can look very similar. But here's what happens: if you run from a thing, you're going to get a cabin somewhere with a couple of girlfriends, and you are going to end up doing nothing. Right. And you're going to get frustrated that you didn't fe- that you showed up with you, you you went with you back to your house. So I'm going to go on a vacation for a very specific reason. I'm going to go and take five books and sit in a cabin for three days and do absolutely nothing. And my goal is restoration. Or I came Mm -hmm. back from my trip more exhausted than when I left. I It was eight degrees outside. It was freezing. (laughs) We were hiking through snow up mountains. It was madness. Um, So I came back more exhausted, but my goal wasn't to go get restoration. My goal was to go hit control, delete, right? Right. Right. So so I plan that going into it. Okay. Yeah. And I feel like restoration is definitely needed. Maybe there's a little bit of the escape idea, Mm -hmm. but more so just because 2022 was a terrible year. (laughs) Um, And I just need a a break. Basically what I do is I wake up in the morning and immediately start going, 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 doing real estate things, Mm -hmm. handling kids and, and making sure everything is good in the house. And then when everybody goes to bed, I'm up for three or four hours doing school. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so, some of that is burnt. some of that is yeah yeah absolutely and some of that's seasonal right you are going to graduate yeah. um right. the real estate market is on a dumpster fire right now and it will come back right right like, so you're in a you're in a wild season right now G- more broadly speaking mm-hmm. i'm more yeah. concerned that once those things level back out you're going to find more stuff just to fill them 
Um, my friend mm-hmm. Ian Simpkins, he's a pastor here in, in Nashville. He said a line recently that just melted me. He said, if busyness is your drug, rest will feel like stress. Okay. And if you're creating a world that is super busy all of the time on top of the busyness of just being a mother of a few young kids, mm-hmm. you're going to cross the line, the graduation stage, and you're going to immediately fill that that void with more crap. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I want you to build a life you don't have to run away from. Yeah. And go away and have fun and enjoy your <laughs> life, right? Go go on a trip. And, yeah. and um, I'm not going to lie. My wife says, I don't vacation well with you sometimes. I need to go away by myself for three or four days with some friends. There's a little piece of me that hurts my feelings. Like, I wish I was yeah. like, I wish she was like, you make me calm and you bring me restoration but I'm a little bit not like that. I, I a little bit more chaotic, right? And so yeah. I wish I wasn't. I do, I do. I just am. And so the next best thing is I can honor her and be super excited that she's going to take care of herself and she's yeah. um, getting restoration and, and all that kind of stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah, that totally makes sense. I appreciate it. Thank you so you much. You got it. So here's your homework assignment, okay? Homework okay. assignment is I want you to get by yourself, go get coffee. And I know this is a tall order. Even if you got to get up half an hour early, okay? Mm-hmm. You're going to be super tired. Um, have an extra coffee this one particular morning. And I want okay. you to write down your needs. Okay. Here's what I need in my house. And usually for a, a mom in your situation, I need help with the kids. And I know my mm-hmm. husband's working really hard, but it's just not me in school. When I go to school, we're both in school. And right. it's not just I have three kids. We have three kids. And I know he's working hard and I still need some help. And right. I need to get three days so that I can go just laugh and cut up with my girlfriends. I need three days so mm-hmm. I can just go stare off into space and whatever. Awesome. And if he comes back with, um, well, then I get my three days. Your response needs to be, honey, I'm not in competition with you. Yeah. I'm not competing with you. We're not going to go back and forth. We're not on a teeter-totter here. Um, right. what you need, you, you need, and what I need, I need. And I want to learn how to say my needs out loud and us together to figure out how we can both meet those. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense completely. And Thank I know you that, so can, much. that can be a pipe dream for some folks I know, cause I know that some husbands or wives or whatever, are just, I ain't doing that. I'll tell you, if you're listening and your romantic partner, your spouse comes to you and says, look. I, I need this, or I really want to take a trip with my girlfriends. I want to take a trip with my, with the guys. <sighs> Try it just once and say that's amazing. Can we plan the? Can we plan the exit? Like what the a couple of days before you go? Can we plan the reentry a couple of days after you get back? Can we plan what that will look like? so that we're all on the same page and I can best love and honor you as you come back, as you go, right? Um, Can we do that together? That'd be amazing. Um, Try, it's practice, just try it once. And if it's a disaster, that's on me. Try once, being excited. Even if you gotta fake it. I'm all in, I'm all in. Go have your trip, go have fun, get away. You deserve it, you've been working really hard. I'll pick up some slack. When you get back, um, I'll, I'll be excited to see you. Try that instead of, what about me? That's expensive. Man, give the gifts of uh, support. Try that. We'll be right back. Hey, Deloney here. One of the things I love about my job is answering the tough questions people have when they call into the show. Your stories are incredible, and each person's situation is unique. And for years, people from all over the world have been asking if I do private counseling or private coaching sessions for them or for their spouse. And as much as I'd love to, I can't realistically do one-on-one coaching sessions with every single person. It's just not possible. But that's exactly why I wrote my new book, Own Your Past, Change Your Future. Within the pages of this book is exactly what I would say if you and I were sitting down together at a table looking for the next right move for you to make in your relationships or to help you live a more whole and peaceful life. As you read through each section of this book, I will show you how to look and own the roads from your past and head to the new roads of a well life moving forward. Go to johndeloney.com to get your copy today. That's Own Your Past, 
Change your future at johndeloney.com. All right, we're back. And as we wrap up today's show, today's show is a little bit rambly, huh? Kind of all over the place. Um, this is Kelly's favorite breakfast song. She sings it every morning at breakfast with a big smile on her face. It's her happiest time of the day. Songs by the great Rupert Holmes. I don't know if he's great. He may be a terrible human. I don't know. By Rupert Holmes. The song's called Escape, the Pina Colada song. Rupert writes and Kelly sings, I was tired of my lady. We've been together too long, like a worn out recording of a favorite song. So while she's laying there sleeping, I read the paper in bed in the personal columns. There was a letter I read. If you like pina coladas and getting caught in the rain, if you're not into yoga, if you have half a brain, if you like making love at midnight in the dunes of the Cape, then I'm the love you've looked for. Write to me and escape. And that's when Kelly goes running out the house every single morning. <laughs> ah, I love you all. See you soon. Don't date the metaverse. God almighty.